whereas there's a lot of already things in place, you know, preventing odor, sound, nuisance, that sort of thing that don't really necessitate us having another ordinance. Um, and then aside from that, also looking uh, at business licenses for urban farms in Chicago to make sure that we have a, a stable ground to really uh, establish our businesses to, to really um, just bolster our local food system. So those are a couple of things that we've been working on uh, as an organization. Um, and I'm, you know, very uh, motivated to do this work. Uh, not only because I'm self, I run a community garden in my neighborhood. I also came to AUA from running uh, and being the owner operator of the Chicago Mushroom Company um, and got started in all this work just because of recognizing, you know, getting, taking a hard look at a food system, um, but also because of the fact that I was diagnosed with a chronic illness at a relatively young age. I was about 15 years old and it's directly related to food um, and different uh, intolerances and allergies that I've developed over the years. So that has caused me to become one of those immunocompromised people. So having control over my own food and recognizing the impact that that can have just on the larger scale of things has become pretty core uh, to, to what drives me and motivates me to do this work. That is great, Vivian. Thank you so much for sharing that, and especially your personal story too, because I think we live in a food system now that has been dominated by a very large, um, I would say, industrial food production that has probably be, I mean, not probably, I mean, it has put American's health at uh, less of a priority than profit for a lot of these organizations. And I think this does highlight the fact that growing your own food and fruits and vegetables and that kind of thing and raising livestock even like chickens and that kind of stuff is just I think it's so cool to just highlight how we can learn to take care of ourselves a little bit better especially like I said in light of this whole COVID-19 situation and uh, I'm sure if any of you folks have been to grocery stores anytime recently there is a lot of panic buying um, from what we can tell right now our food system is still fairly stable there's not been like actual supply shortages of a lot of things, but it does highlight that that situation can change very quickly. I mean, we saw it over the course of about 72 hours in stores across the state, having a run on what we would consider essential things like bread, milk, um, obviously toilet paper has been saying not that we're gonna be making toilet paper in our own homes or anything like that. But um, it does highlight how um, sensitive our system is um, in terms of like all that's happening. Um, with that, I kind of want to change over to Nicole Virgil for a second. Um, as I said, Nicole Virgil is a resident of Elmhurst, just outside the city. Um, and related to all this food insecurity stuff, there's been a lot of people that have been really focusing on trying to take care of their own families by growing their own produce. And Nicole has her own personal story, albeit kind of a frustrating and sad one regarding what has been happening in her hometown. Um, Nicole, could you um, kind of tell everybody briefly what has been happening in Elmhurst? Oh, Nicole, are you muted right now or I just not hear you? Oh, oh, maybe now. Can you hear me now? Yep, we gotcha. Okay. <laughs> so a few years back, maybe 2012, 13, I decided I wanted to try and start growing some of my own food because I wanted to try and start growing some of my own food. I thought it would be a good idea and self-reliance and teaching my kids, you know, where their food comes from and having fresher, more nutritionally dense food, I thought would be a good idea. So we just raised, we, we put up some raised beds in our backyard. We thought it was no big deal. And uh, very quickly, it took us like a couple of growing seasons to realize that it's a pretty short growing season here where we are. And so there's a lot of crops that are just barely coming online when the temperatures are starting to drop in the fall. And we thought it would be a great idea if we could extend that growing season. And so with a little bit of research, we figured out that you know you could cover your garden and use the passive solar heating to keep those crops going um, either longer or you could put in a fall garden and get winter crops you know, that you could harvest through the winter uh, with something called a high tunnel or a hoop house. And uh, so my husband who's um, pretty engineering minded designed something with some research and we covered the bed and very quickly got a citation from the a violation notice 
from the city of Elmhurst due to the complaint of one neighbor um, that they did not like the appearance of the hoop house. And long story short, after four years of struggling with the municipal government, um, they determined that our temporary structure would not be allowed because it's not, quote, in keeping with the character of Elmhurst. So um, <laughs> that was very disappointing. That was January of 2019. And since then, uh, I've been working at the state level with Elliot and the rest of you guys at IEC to uh, put some protection in place at the state level so that um, municipal governments can't prohibit people from producing food on their own property within local zoning regs, you know, reasonable zo zoning regs, um, as there's dozens of reasons why people should have the ability to, to sustain themselves. It's kind of a natural right to, to be able to produce food. It's kind of American as well, I think. <laughs> but teaching your children clean food, uh, Viviana's issue of being immunocompromised, or some people have health reasons. There's also food deserts where people don't have access to whole foods or grocery stores or fresh produce. Um, there's also the issue of property rights and just freedom and liberty. Maybe it's something you'd want to do. It's harmless, it's productive, it's good for the community. It's really not something that municipal governments should have the ability to squelch so long as the person's doing it in a reasonable way, which we certainly are. Our, our practices are well beyond organic. We're building soil. Um, you know, it, it's a good thing. So we're still working on it. We haven't won yet, but I'm not close to done. Yeah, well, we really appreciate that, Nicole. And um, as she had mentioned, she's been working really closely with um, the Illinois Environmental Council and Advocates for Urban Agriculture and the Institute for Justice, uh, the Illinois Stewardship Alliance. Who am I missing? NAACP. Uh, NAACP. And um, Illinois Coalition for Informed Consent is also on board. Gotcha, thank you. And um, one of the things that we introduced this year um, was kind of a big, bold, ambitious bill called the Illinois Right to Garden Act, which essentially said that local governments could not regulate gardening um, within certain parameters. Um, obviously, with the legislative session happening as it is, this has kind of thrown this bill into flux um, as we move forward. But this bill, I think, highlighted um, that there is bipartisan support for an initiative like this. Um, last, or I believe two years ago, Florida passed something similar um, that allowed people to basically just say local governments cannot regulate gardening at all. Um, Illinois is in a slightly different situation because of our weather not being like Florida is it does necess or necessitate the use of um, devices and techniques that are um, really needed in order to sustain uh, your produce during uh, winter months. Um, Nicole, could you talk a little bit about the, the technical parameters of like a hoop house, like how, why exactly it works the way it does? Yeah, so there's a lot of crops that, um, there's a term that, that is used, it's the hardiness level of a plant. So some crops are cold hardy which means they can sustain colder temperatures. Um, others are not cold hardy, and those would be more tender crops, like summertime crops. You think your tomatoes, your, your uh, zucchinis, things like that, your cucumbers. We're not talking about those types of crops for winter production or harvest. We're talking about things that are, are um, in some cases, able to withstand an infinite number of freeze-thaw cycles, like baby spinach or baby kale which can freeze overnight. And then if they are covered with sufficient protection, um, then when the passive solar gains retained by the hoop house or by uh, the, the season extension device warms the air in the daytime, then those crops thaw and they survive through the winter. So um, some cold hardy, hardy crops would be um, carrots that can be harvested through the winter, um, I, ha I found out accidentally by not harvesting all my potatoes that by keeping them in hoop house that they were absolutely able to be harvested all winter. I didn't try to find that out, but found it out accidentally. And all manner of greens, um, the more uh, 
the more immature the plant, the hardier they are. Um, so mm -hmm. there's, there's a wide spectrum of plants that can be either um, harvested or just you can use the hoop house like a, like a root cellar, sort of, uh, like in the case of carrots. Um, there's a farmer that some people will be interested in, because I think now with what's going on, a lot of people while they're home might be interested in reading about um, these techniques. So Elliot Coleman is a farmer in Maine who actually does not grow in the summer. He starts his growing season in the fall and he grows through the winter by using season extension devices. Why does he do that? He does it so that his local community has access to fresh food through the winter so they don't have to fly in salads from California. So all of that can be attained um, without even heating the structure. If you want to heat it, then you, a whole new world up, opens up. But these are unheated um, uh, season extension devices, high tunnels, hoop houses like that. Very cool. Thank you, Nicole. And um, I'm going to go back to Viviana for a second. Viviana, you said, I kind of want to just talk about maybe like what you do personally. You said that you have chickens in your backyard which I think is really cool. Our coworker Lindsay has chickens in her backyard too. Um, although maybe I'll let her share her chicken chicken coop story here in a second. No, she's no, it's okay. <laughs> uh, but Viviana, can you talk about a little bit like what you do personally and stuff, like in your own in your own yard? Sure. Um, so I uh, I live in a neighborhood that has row houses. So our, our yards are pretty small um, and it, so that, you know, I've got just a little bit of space to work with, but it, it's enough. Um, I also have a community garden down the block, so that helps to expand the space a little bit more. But uh, with the chickens, uh, we've got a significantly sized chicken hoop, coop in the, in the backyard um, and it has, uh, can fit up to probably about, mm, probably about 15 birds uh, easily. Uh, I only have three right now, just trying to keep my flock managed and get, you know, really in the swing of things. I've kept these chickens for a couple of years now. And um, yeah, since uh, it started to warm up a little bit, they're definitely producing a lot more eggs now. And so make me feel a little bit more secure in this time of, um, you know, strange uh, resource, uh, uh, you know, uh, capacity to acquire them, right? Um, so yeah, it's just for us, it's just a matter of, um, you know, keeping it clean, kind of regular maintenance, making sure they have water all the time and uh, keeping their food. And, um, you know, every single day uh, we have neighbors stop by, um, you know, often with strollers to come say hi to the chickens and hang out and feed them little scraps of bread and that sort of thing. So it's become a really nice thing for our neighborhood, just kind of like a, you know, a landmark on a lot of people's dog walks and just walking outside with their children, Definitely, you know, reason for, for conversations and, you know, lots of over the fence conversations with my direct neighbors on just how the chickens are doing. And, um, you know, fortunately they, they are in support of it. Um, you know, I also don't have a rooster, so that definitely helps, um, <laughs> not only for my own sleep schedule, but the people around me. Um, and yeah, that's, that's just kind of how, how I manage my chickens. That is great. Lindsay? Yeah, I just wanted to, um, I know both Nicole and Viviana mentioned um, the ability to grow food at home, making you feel a little more secure and trying times like this and a little more sustainable. Um, and just kind of extrapolating that out to a statewide perspective, I thought maybe Elliot could share a little bit uh, about the good food purchasing plan um, that is kind of a statewide initiative that we're just kind of getting started working on with IEC. And I know the Stewardship Alliance is on um, and quite a few folks have kind of weighed in on this work. But one of the big things this would address is that uh, one of the scary facts about the state of Illinois is that we bring in 98% of our food that we eat here in the state. And with that, we have the blackest soil, the most fertile soil um, in the nation, in the world, we have some of the best um, growing conditions and we can grow pretty much anything here. We're only limited uh, by growing season, like Nicole touched on a little bit. Um, so it's a really sad fact that we bring in so much, uh, such a high percentage of our food. And so Elliot's working on a little bit to address this um, and I'll let him talk, but I wanted to point out something totally anecdotally that I saw on Facebook was um, a dairy in Fairbury, which I think it's Kilgus Farmstead, um, is 
they so they milk their cows and during this time a lot of uh all their contracts go to chicago to restaurants and to coffee houses and right now they were they were posting about it that because of the shutdown because none of those places are open they were afraid that they would be out of a market right now um and but they have to milk you guys know about dairy cows you have to milk them or they'll dry up you have to keep milking them so they were talking about um how they just bottled that milk and they put it in their local uh farm store and how because of the um because all of the regular local stores walmarts and everything are out of milk the community supported them and kind of scooped up all of that milk that they would normally send to like contract full of restaurants um, up in Chicago. And so I thought that was a really cool story about um, that local food infrastructure being an important piece uh, here when we need it. Yeah, no, that's, that's great, Lindsay. Thank you for highlighting that. And yeah, and, and to that point, as Lindsay had said earlier, uh, one of the things that um, we've been working on with the Chicago Food Policy Action Council and um, Illinois Stewardship Alliance is this idea of a good food purchasing program in Illinois. Um, it's been enacted in a couple other uh, big cities and states. Um, it's still kind of in the process of getting off the ground, but here's the idea. Um, right now, as Lindsay said, Illinois imports about 98% of the food that we consume. Um, right now, under current procurement code at the state level, um, there are things like minimum, uh, like bid requirements for food have to be at like the lowest cost is who they've got to award it to. So you can't consider things like um, nutritional value if it came locally as opposed, as opposed to out of state. Um, if there's uh, workers' rights factored into the people that are producing the food that you're going to be eating, um, is it sustainably sourced? Are the animals treated okay? Um, and this uh, Good Food Purchasing Program would eventually, if it was enacted, would essentially try to create a procurement system in the state, especially for K through 12 colleges and other folks that would encourage sustainably locally sourced food. Um, and when I say sustainable, I mean that from an environmental perspective. So, you know, cover crops, fun stuff like that that helps protect water quality and also um, environmentally and socially sustainable, so that workers' rights are protected, that, uh, uh, that it's coming from local um, markets as opposed to us feeding companies that are out of state, and trying to support all of these different um, infrastructure needs that the state has. Right now, we've got a real critical lack of infrastructure when it comes to local food. There has been a growing um, farmer's market um, economy that I think is very um, good, but even with that, there's still a long way to go. Um, I see there's been a couple, a couple of questions in the chat. Maybe I'll go to one of those just briefly, really quick. Um, one of them is for Nicole. They just said um, they were asking what it's uh, Rebecca was asking what branch of the NAACP is supporting your cause up in Elmhurst. DuPage, Kane County. DuPage King County. Thank you, Nicole. And then um, I see another one from Daniel Gonzalez here. It says, the city of Highland Park passed a chicken keeping ordinance last year. If anyone is interested in learning more about a suburban, suburban community's path to increasing local food infrastructure, and he lists uh, his email there along with uh, Katie Friedman, which is great. Really appreciate that, uh, Daniel. Thank you so much. Um, now I want to trade it over to Kathy, who we have not really uh, heard from yet. Uh, Kathy, as we said, just obtained her uh, Master Gardener's uh, certification. And Kathy, uh, can we, could you start by explaining exactly what that means and what it entails? Um, that's something, that's a fairly new, I think, concept to even me, um, working in ag at least for a little while. But um, Kathy, could you explain that a little bit? Sure. Um, I took it through the Botanic Gardens. Every county has the program from Illinois um, every other year. And it's a series of classes um, that you have to take in all different categories, like botany, soil, vegetables, um, trees, shrubs. And it's a very thorough, not, not as thorough as you know, getting a degree in it, but um, kind of a, 
an overseeing of each individual category. And then after that, um, volunteer in different places at Botanic Garden in all the different categories. Um, it's a year program, and then you have to continue to work at Botanic um, to keep up your certification. Mm -hmm. And what kind of things, do they have you focus on growing certain kinds of things? Is it geared towards, you know, produce, or is it more geared towards flowers, or is it a mix? Uh, could you um, expand on that? It's a, it's a total mix of things. Um, I was in their vegetable garden, which is awesome, um, part of the time, and then I was in the annuals and um, perennials, and then, um, like, the roses. So it's it was all summer long, twice a week, I was volunteering in these different areas. Mm -hmm. Very cool. And I think, I think you're a great one to ask about this. And we'll turn it over to Nicole and Viviana too for um, some expansion on this. But obviously, we are all shut-ins right now. Um, Correct. <laughs> it's, it's very difficult for us to be able to go out and do, you know, things. And a lot of people are kind of twiddling their thumbs at sitting at home trying to think like, you know, what can I do? To, you know, not only keep myself occupied, but maybe be kind of productive. And, um, <clears throat> excuse me, I think gardening is a great way to maybe allow you to work from home and do something, you know, mentally stimulating. And I was hoping you could talk about maybe some things that folks could do right now, even though we're kind of in the end stages of winter, that maybe they could do right. to start doing something maybe just even indoors um, that you would suggest. Well, it's, it's actually, it's obviously too early to plan. Um, you shouldn't really plant your veg actual vegetables until after the first frost, um, which sometimes is so hard for people to do. But what you could do right now, and it's a good time to do, is to start um, with seeds growing your herbs. If you have a, a nice sunny or lit area, um, the, herb, the herbs will do very well starting them. And then you can always transplant them outside if you want. Although I would recommend always keeping herbs in a pot some of them will go wild on you, and some of them, like basil, does not like to be in the ground. Um, and some of the herbs are perennials themselves, so they will come back. So if you want them in the ground, you can transplant them. But it's a good time to start that from seed if you want to do that. Um, Very cool. The important, thing with that, the important thing with that is, though, um, I know the city has different kind of soil. I, I, live, I live out in Lake Zurich, so it's different out here um, but the most important thing to do when you're putting anything in a pot is to use organic potting soil um, never plant in topsoil because it's too thick and dense and it won't take the seedlings very well um, the organic soil is loose and it will drain the water better because you don't want those roots to get too wet because those roots will rot on you yeah also, I think that Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, I was just going to also say, and it's, what you're doing with seeds, it's a good thing to use like a plant starter. There's all different kinds. I like biotone, um, but you can use um, those and mend it into your soil and then plant your seedlings and never overwater them because they will rot. And then one question in the chat Ma, that we'll get to. So real quick question, and Elliot wants to move on, but there's a question in the chat that says, uh, kale, spinach, and cold leather seeds can be planted in March, April, too. Is that right? That's correct. Lettuce, you can do. Um, any of the cool plants. Lettuce does very well this time of the year. Um, so does spinach. But with spinach and kale, um, add a little sand to the soil um, because that, they, especially spinach, really likes sand in the soil. Great. Thanks. Uh -huh. Cool. Well, um, I was just actually texted by Matt a second ago, and apparently uh, Representative Harper has joined us now, which is great. Um, Matt, can you, is she unmuted right now? We got her on? I think so. If you're there, uh, Rep Harper, maybe you could. I'm here. Can you hear something? me, Frank? <laughs> yep. There we go. We've got you. Representative, thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. I know you are very, very busy with everything that's going on right now. Yes, sir. Actually, I was, we were just on a call. The uh, caucus was just on a call, and they're still going right now. So I just had to join in uh, for a few minutes to join you guys. Um, so I'm happy to uh, help in any way that I can. Thank you so much for having us today. 
Yeah, no, thank you. We've kind of just been talking generally about, um, we've got advocates for everyone in agriculture on the phone. We've got Nicole Virgil from Elmhurst, who's uh, the bill that you sponsored with the right to garden was kind of an emphasis of that whole situation. But um, Representative, could you just talk briefly about, um, right now you're the chairwoman of the House Agriculture Committee. Um, and I was wondering if you could just talk to people about why you're so interested in this personally and um, kind of what got you what got you thinking about why it's so important, especially with urban agriculture? Sure, sure, sure. So definitely love to share, you know, what got the, what got me into this personally. Um, but just in, you know, in light of what we've been going through in Illinois in the past two weeks and across the country, you know, with COVID-19, you know, there, there's no other time for me um, um, to promote, you know, growing your own food. So again, thank you guys for having this, this webinar today. And in fact, myself, um, I didn't run out to the grocery stores like everyone else buying tissue. The first place I went uh, was online to Territorial Seed Company to make sure that I had enough seeds to start um, to begin my garden um, and even thinking what can I grow and perhaps put in the ground right now. Um, and so that is something that I have been doing in my community over the past 10 years. Um, I live in Inglewood in Chicago and we're a food desert there. And so years ago, residents, decided that they would take their own food access into their hands and they would use their vacant land there um, as a way to grow food through urban farms and through promoting more community gardening, but also this idea of creating a local healthy food system um, in a community, again, that not just suffers from crime and violence um, as the number one headline, but to me, the number one headline are the fact that most people in my community uh, and communities like mine, hundreds of thousands of people are dying from preventable dye-related diseases simply, uh, and one of the biggest reasons why is because they don't have access to healthy food. And so anytime we can educate people on growing their own food and taking their own healthy food access into their own hands, um, we'd love to do that. And so I've worked on doing that in the community by working on an urban farm, growing home, Shout out to Growing Home in West Inglewood, doing wonderful work there, um, but also even spreading that to a larger level community-wide and developing spaces and more land and getting more resources uh, and materials for urban farmers, even more training uh, for people wanting to go into the business and even uh, just educating residents on healthy living and how to do their own gardens. And so that work has led uh, me to now being the chair of agriculture, uh, even before being the chair, I sponsored and passed many laws, um, one of them being the urban agriculture bill that gives incentives to urban farmers, such as uh, reductions on water rates and electricity. Um, I also passed a food desert bill, which now requires the state to track food desert. So, you know, even in times like these, we should know if the Department of Public Health did their job, every we should know what those food insecure areas of are of the state and and in the in in any time um, that we do have problems, I think that those people who are most vulnerable should be put first in line or should definitely be paid attention to. Another thing um, that I passed related to food and farming um, is also the Farmer Equity Act, making sure that much needed grants and resources get to farmers of color, women farmers, uh, and other farmers who have um, who are deemed socially disadvantaged. And so all of that work has now led to me being appointed chairwoman of agriculture, which I'm very proud to, and now not only speaking up for urban agriculture um, throughout the state, but all types of agriculture. Um, I, again, I think that right now in this time, people are really seeing how important our food system is, how even important localizing our own food system is, and how we can empower residents um, to grow their own food or just be a little bit more educated on supporting those local healthy food systems so that they are around um, when we need them. That is, that is so great to hear, Representative Harper. Thank you so much for joining us. I'll let you go here in a second, but I've just got one quick question for you. Um, sure. what, are, what are you starting to grow yourself right now? And like, what are you, what are you kind of prepping for, for the spring and the summer? So, yeah, I'm just growing, you know, more regular cool weather crops. I'm excited to um, get my spinach um, together as well as I'm going to be potting up some herbs here with my daughter in a few moments. We like to do a herbal tea garden. I'll be doing that as well as, you know, the herbs I'll need to cook with definitely lettuce. So, you know, the normal things that I would grow 
on any other year in my garden. Onions, scallions, um, those things I'm really starting um, to, to start uh, even more seriously now. I will say that in these last couple of years that I've been in the legislature, um, I have not um, been paying as much attention to my community garden and even my personal garden. Um, but again, like this just experience changed that for me. And I am totally stocked up on seeds. Um, I'm totally stocked up on my organic potting mix. And even later today, me and my daughter, again, are going to be starting our seeds. And I even have grow lamps. So um, we're ready. And I, I would encourage all of my other people to get ready too. Just just because this is a, a good thing to do for your family anyway, not not and hopefully not because we will um, you know, be having food scarcity issues in the future. Yeah. Well representative, thank you so much. I don't want to keep you any longer. I know you've still got calls going on and everything with uh obviously the whole flux of what's going on in the legislature. So I just want to say thank you so much. We've got some follow up questions from some folks, but we'll 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 get to those off the phone. Um, but thank again, you thank so you much. so much for being here. We really appreciate it. All right. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Yep. You too. Um, yeah. So I think, uh, obviously, that's great that we had the representative join for a few minutes. It's great to hear from her. She is, like a, as she said, the chairwoman of the House Agriculture and Conservation Committee. So um, the big ones that uh, all the ag bills that she sponsors all go through there. Um, she also, as I said, sponsored our Right to Garden bill. Um, and we're very excited about that. She's done a, a number of other initiatives that are awesome. One thing that she brought up, I think it'd be interesting to turn Nicole over to, um, there's an educational component with doing your own garden and stuff, especially if you have children. And I think at this point, you know, there's a lot of parents, I think, that are scrambling, trying to figure out, like, what am I going to do with my kids? They're not in school right now. Like, they've got online courses, but um, especially for kids that aren't even in uh, K through 12 yet, like, what can I do? Nicole, can you talk about your experience with gardening and like your kids and, you know, how they, how you got them involved and all that? Yeah, sure. Uh, sure. Before, before I get into that, let me, add, if I may, add something to Kathy's recommendation about starting plants right now. Um, mm -hmm. This is sort of an answer to both of those questions. Uh, something that's great to do with your kids right now, while it is still too cold to be putting plant starts in the ground, assuming you don't have a hoop house, um, you can do microgreens inside. And uh, if I may put in, uh, sh there's lots of videos online about how to start microgreens, but um, I just posted one on my YouTube channel, which is the Right to Garden YouTube channel with a, an eight-year-old boy and showing how kids can start their own microgreens and he made his own salad with the microgreens and he was really into it. So this is something that kids can do now and the turnaround on microgreens, depending upon the, the seeds that you're planting is anywhere from seven to 14 days. So it's a fast turnaround, you know, whereas, you know, when we're working out in the field, you're looking, you know, anywhere from 45 to 60 days for your fast turnaround crops, which for a little kid is, is a little bit longer. So I would recommend microgreens for people. And while you're thinking about doing microgreens with your kids, as long as you're not under a shelter in place order, maybe you can jump out to a local mom and pop garden shop and get some of your organic potting soil there. Um, you know, now they, I know they've got all the materials to do that. Um, in terms of what I did with my kids, um, we started out with a four by four foot bed and we used, uh, it's called a lot of different things, John Jevons method, square foot gardening, biointensive gardening, where the crops are fairly close together. And so I gave each of my kids a few of their own square feet and we mixed up that 16 square feet with you know, onions and lettuce and, and herbs and all different things. Uh, and then I think the thing that they uh, we're in a suburb, so a lot of their friends were like, are you farming or what? You know, like, <laughs> but what was cool about it was that they, after maybe, it didn't take too long, maybe two growing seasons, where they could recognize all the plants based on their leaves. So even when they were young, before the, the plant would set fruit, um, they could tell what the plants were going to be, which made them very confident, because when they would when people would stop by from the neighborhood or whatever, they would give a garden tour. And even before the plants had tomatoes on it, or even before the plants, you know, had peppers on it, 
they could say, oh, this is, this is this type of plant, this is this type of plant. And a lot of adults don't know that information. So in terms of working with your children, this is a side benefit. There's a lot of confidence building that comes when children learn something that a lot of adults don't know, wow, the confidence they get is really huge. And they realize this is something of value. Like you can't fake that. You know, when an adult is like, wait, tell me, how do you know that? Like they can tell immediately, I know something they want to know. I have something of value. Um, it's, it, it was an indirect benefit. It wasn't, you know, the main purpose of why I was growing food, but I'm mentioning it now just for parents who are at home who, you know, were as, as a parent, I, I was a homeschooling mom and I know all parents anyway are trying to figure out how to teach their children morals and confidence and work ethic. You're always, you know, assessing these things in the back of your mind. Growing food is one of those things that because everybody eats, there's a wide range of application where this knowledge base that you're teaching your children can be extrapolated to um, lots of other scenarios and people that they will come in contact with. So I encourage parents to start, you know, start today with microgreens and uh, keep it going through the spring. And you only need a few square feet. You don't need to do your whole backyard, just start small and you'll figure out, you know, what your family likes to eat and what they don't. Zucchini is, is very easy to grow. My family won't eat it. So, you know, I grew it for a while, but you have to find out what your family likes and then grow, you know, grow what you like. And there's so many varieties of things that you can grow yourself, which are not available in the grocery store. This is a cool thing too, for your kids to go to school with varieties of vegetables or whatever that other people don't even necessarily recognize. It's, it's like kind of a cool factor. So um, yeah. there's life skills, there's the sustainability issues, there's work ethic. Um, there's just having a lot of, you know, since our whole backyard is raised beds, my daughter will go back there and just eat. Like, you know, I'll send her out with a big bowl to harvest for dinner. She'll come back with the bowl, not all that full and say, well, I don't know, you know, and she will, she'll be done eating. <laughs> because, you know, and over time, this really builds a great palate for the child. They can recognize what fresh food is because they're eating it all the time. You know, and so when we ran out once to get a quick salad someplace at a salad bar, maybe at Whole Foods or something, my daughter at the time, I think she was eight or nine, and she said, Mom, this isn't, this isn't fresh. <laughs> this isn't fresh. Like, and again, another indirect lesson being taught, you know, you can't teach that in five minutes to a kid because they're not interested. They don't care. But after harvesting and eating fresh food regularly, then when they get presented with stuff, then they're like, oh, that's yeah. not right. <laughs> so anyway. that, is, that, that is too new. That is too cool, Nicole. Thank you so much. And I know, I, I'm sure we've got some parents on this call and stuff. And I think that is a great lesson for them. Um, now, okay, we're, so we're at 1247 right now. We've got about 13-ish minutes left of this uh, webinar. But I wanted to turn it over to uh, questions and answers. We've gotten a lot of uh, questions in the chat that uh, I believe Matt and Lindsay have been looking at. Um, Matt, do you want to turn it over to a question to one of our, our participants? Uh, sure. So I, uh, I've been keeping a little bit of a, a stack here. So I'll just I'll start from the top and we can work down. Um, so uh, IUC's own Colleen Smith. Uh, has a question here for Viviana, and she's asking, Viviana, if you could talk more about uh, efforts to restrict live livestock and gardening, um, like the City of Chicago Ordinance, and what drives the misconceptions that create those issues, and maybe how do you go about breaking down uh, that misinformation? Sure. So, you know, in, introducing a new livestock ordinance isn't really going to get at the core uh, of the issue, in, in my personal opinion, and opinion of many people throughout our network, um, because, you know, the primary issues that folks have with, you know, whether it's chickens or possibly even goats as well is, you know, they're worried that they're going to attract rats. They're worried that it's going, you know, all of that, uh, all of their poop is going to be stinky. Um, they're worried about the sounds and the noise issues that might come up. Um, and you know, among, you know, other uh, sometimes irrational fears that might also pop up. Um, but all of those things that I've mentioned, certainly with the sound from roosters or from, you know, bleeding goats, um, 
they um, that's that's already covered by uh, noise ordinances in the city of Chicago and many other municipalities as well. The issue of you know potential um, stinky encounters um, also dealt with through odor nuisance. You can report an odor nuisance, um, and that's already covered in the you know in our municipal code. Um, and those those being the primary things, you know, there's issues around of course commercial activity and that you know zoning and you know that's a little bit more of a gray area of what's allowed and where it's allowed. Um, but you know I've heard over and over again both the sound and the odor being the main issues, and that's already covered. So in, if you're asking to apply an additional ordinance on top of that, what is the purpose there? Because you, you are effectively limiting limiting people's ability to, you know, produce their own food at their own homes or in their own neighborhoods. Um, so that, that's kind of the, the things that I've, I've just heard over and over again, um, you know, and with commercial activity, again, it's coming back to, you know, what kind of food system do we want, especially in this, you know, current era that we're in right now, having a hyper localized food system is absolutely to our benefit. Um, so what, what is the purpose there? What's, what is, you know, why, why have something in addition to what we already have. Um, so that's, that's kind of what I've seen over and over again. A lot of times it just ends up being, you know, similar situations as, as season extension is just a lot of nimbyism that's happening, right? Um, you know, neighbors taking issue, um, but that isn't necessarily for our, our personal or collective benefit if, if we choose to just hear those voices versus, you know, those of, of, of reason of wanting to be able to produce our own food locally. Great. Thanks, Savannah. And we'll just hop straight to the next question. Is that good, Elliot? Yeah, yeah, that's great. Okay, great. Uh, so Rebecca Ratliff asks, uh, does our, and this might be for you, Elliot, so uh, just heads up, does our state government have any say over which farmers slash crops get subsidized or is this all left to the national government with farm bills? This is largely federal government with the farm bill, but also with emergency bills that are passed. Um, this last year in 2019, I'm sure as everybody saw, there was horrible flooding in the state that adversely affected a lot of corn and soybean farmers. And um, this was not just in Illinois, but, you know, Iowa, Kansas, all over the Midwest. Um, I think I just read recently about 40 ish percent of farmer income in the United States was subsidized by the federal government last year. Um, it's a pretty shocking number. Uh, we're still trying to get a grip kind of on how we can support traditional ag, but in a way that's not leading to these situations where the almost half of it is being subsidized by our own tax dollars. And a lot of that I think has to do with you know, the environmental sustainability aspect of traditional commercial farming has gotten very, very bad in recent years. Illinois is one of the leading contributors to nitrogen and phosphorus um, loads into the Gulf of Mexico, into the Mississippi River, and we need to change farming practices. And if we had better soils and took better care of the land that we're cultivating, flooding probably wouldn't be as bad. Our soil would be more resilient to, uh, um, absorbing all of those things and mitigating flooding and helping protect communities and um, natural areas in our state. But yes, the state has largely nothing to do with subsidizing um, farmers. It's largely federal, but it definitely highlights that the current status quo for how that is done um, needs to be changed sooner rather than later, which is something IEC is actively working on with a number of our partners. Great. Thanks, Elliot. And uh, this one is for you, Kathy. And it's coming from Jen, who asks, uh, if I'm growing herbs in a pot and there are too many and too many seedlings sprout, how should I cut down the number? You can tell. Um, you need to thin them out. Any seedlings Ma, like Ma, hold on one second. I'm sorry. I had you muted. If you could start that one over. Uh, I appreciate it. Okay. With any seedlings that you plant, you have to thin them out. So you look for the hardiest one um, or two, um, but you want to get the ones that are not hardy out of there um, so that the root system can develop for the ones that are. And how do you go removing those? You just, you just pluck them out? Pluck them out because they really have no thick, the roots are so thin that it, they just pluck them out. They're very easy to pluck out. Okay, Jen, you got to pluck them out. 
uh, <laughs> and I was moving down to here. Can I add one thing? <laughs> yeah, yeah, go for it. Um, I was just going to add something to what Nicole was saying. I was just going to say that a good thing to do right now is because I know in the city there's such limited space, um, is to research the different time, kinds of planting places that you can use. Um, Nicole did a really good job in the raised garden, but there's also um, straw bales that you can use, small straw bales that are awesome because we, it has to be straw, not hay, because um, they don't get very many weeds and pretty much anything will grow in it. Um, there's also concrete berm beds for concrete or, or um, asphalt. Um, and then, of course, you've got your pot planting that you can do. But the straw is a very new thing, or not new, but it's been used much more now. Um, and you just put the seeds in there with potting soil, and you pretty much an easy thing to do, and it doesn't take up much space. Okay, great. That actually, that does answer one of the, the next questions, which was, um, uh, Jay Martinez asks, um, what can you grow, uh, what do you suggest uh, growing inside if you don't have access to space or a yard to start a garden plot that's outside? So I feel like that can go to any of our speakers here. Um, uh, Lindsay, do you want to talk, I saw you mentioned this kind of in the chat, a little fun device that we, we got for our office and then I just got one for our yeah. house last year. Can you talk about that? Yeah, because Elliot was jealous. He saw it on my desk. It's just a, it's called Aero Garden. They're pretty cheap. You can get them in different pods. Like uh -huh. the one that we had in the office was three. Um, and it does herbs and uh, greens. And I think we did basil and lettuce in it. And it was just enough to have a little bit of extra fresh green something through the winter for us in our office. Um, but it's super low inputs. It automatically waters it. It took care of itself while we went on conferences and away for the weekend. Um, so that was a really good thing. And then just for other things you can do inside, Kathy, did you have more to add? I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. I other said just for other uh, things that you can grow indoors. Um, well, you can pretty much grow anything in a pot. The thing about pots is you have to make sure it's the right size. Um, I would just recommend herbs or like lettuce spinach, that kind of thing. Tomatoes or peppers, that kind of will not do well inside. Um, but it, they grow very well in the straw and they grow very well in pots also. It's, and it's, so if you have even a little space outside where it's sunny, it has to be very sunny. Um, pretty much anything will grow well. You can ask Matthew about the pots of tomatoes that he had. <laughs> um, yeah, I, uh, I was, my mom gave me a tomato in a pot and I put it uh, I went, I snuck out a door of my old apartment and put it on top of the garage neighboring my building. And uh, we had more tomatoes than we could possibly eat. So that was, that was very good. Yeah, as long as it's, as long as my it's favorite funny. thing is, go ahead. Oh, no, I was just going to say, and I also recommend planting heirloom tomatoes. They are the best. Um, they're very disease resistant. Um, and the tomatoes are unbelievable. They're very ugly, but they're very, very good. <laughs> uh, that's a really good point. I was going to say that my favorite thing is baby spinach in the windowsill because you can keep cutting it and, and they, it keeps growing back in just a week or two. Um, and baby spinach is just so tender and you can use it in so many things. Um, but that's a great point about heirloom varieties and um, sourcing seeds locally, is that if you work uh -huh. with these local seed supply stores, um, the kind of the mom and pop ones, you can get seeds that are really uh, evolved and set up for, for where you're growing, for your soils, for the Midwest, for Illinois, um, and, and you'll have better success because those are seeds that have done well there um, and have been harvested. And then maybe just a, a quick plug, we're not working on this this year, um, but in years past, IEC worked with Illinois Stewardship Alliance to pass a seed library bill um, because for some insane reason that has to do with Monsanto and seed uh, rights, the seed libraries weren't legal in Illinois and a seed library is um, kind of like a card catalog of seeds that uh, are hosted by different institutions. A lot of times local libraries host them. 
Um, and you can go in and you can check out seeds and plant them. And then they just ask that you bring back like a little envelope of seeds that you harvest at the end of the season. Um, and you can put it back into the collection. And that's a really good way to get seeds that are super hardy and good for your area. Um, and it's a really good way to keep, uh, you know, sustainability and, and seed availability in our local communities so that we're not all stuck buying Roundup Ready field corn instead of all these great varieties of sweet corn um, and different things that are available in our localities. Great. And then let's sneak in one last question. Uh, and I think this will be you, Viviana, but the question comes from Tanisha, who asks, uh, can residents buy empty lots in their neighborhoods and turn them into community farms or, or community gardens rather? Um, and then maybe that gets to a broader question of how do you go about getting involved in a community garden? Sure. Um, yeah, so uh, Chicago residents are definitely allowed to purchase lots in, in their neighborhoods um, and with the possibility of turning them into community gardens. Um, the main point being there, particularly if it's in a res residentially zoned area that there isn't tech, um, you know, technically commercial activity. That's kind of like the main parameter uh, that we see pop up often. Um, the $1 lot program, uh, we've seen about 30% of the people who've purchased those lots being interested in, in uh, pursuing uh, growing projects. Um, so that's definitely something that we're seeing uh, happening um, quite a bit. But really, I would like to encourage also um, raised beds whenever possible or being just really conscientious of what has been on that property before, uh, because you might run into some soil contamination issues. And it's in fact, putting the farmers themselves at the highest risk because uh, lead is transferred by kicking up dust. Um, and so if that is present in your soil, that like you're going to be exposed most frequently. So that's just something to be, keep in mind. So raised beds are typically going to be recommended for, for growing, um, you know, within neighborhoods in the city of Chicago. And um, we've got a bunch of resources on our website of how, what are the safest ways to do that as well. Um, and there was a second part to that question. Just want to make sure I cover it all. Oh, just how to get involved with your community garden, but it sounds yeah. like those resources are a good place to start. Certainly. There's also the Chicago Urban Agriculture Mapping Project, which is also hosted on our website, auachicago.org, uh, which lists uh, oh, the over 800 community gardens that exist throughout the city of Chicago. Um, so it's an easy way to just kind of find your neighborhood, zero in on it, and be able to locate what's the closest to you and get involved from there. That is great. Thank you so much, Viviana. Um, we are at 101 right now. So I think we're going to wrap up. But um, just as a couple of closing things, I wanted to say thank you to everybody that helped participate in this and everybody that had questions and just listened in. Um, with everything that's going on in the world right now, I think it is great that we can all put a bunch of our faces on the screen and actually have some social interaction outside of me, like just getting angry at my cat for knocking stuff off the table and fun stuff like that. Um, but uh, <laughs> Uh, Tucker, our communications, uh, our communications director, put a link in the uh, chat. If anybody um, values this and wants to see it continue, we definitely encourage you guys to donate to IEC. It helps us out a lot um, maintaining our uh, operations and helping get more info out there. And then I see uh, Viviana, you posted a link. Can you talk about your what you posted just for a second? Sure. Um, aside from our website, I also posted a link to our water sign-on letter. Um, uh, recently, urban farm businesses have been having their water shut off or are losing access to municipal water for growing in the city of Chicago. So we've been banding together and engaging stakeholders to draft a proposal uh, to create a new water hydrant permit. Um, so this is just a sign-on letter that we're asking folks at if you agree with it to go and sign on so that we can show that we've been building support behind us when we do uh, interact with our city officials, um, just to let them know that, you know, this is one of the key ways, absolutely key ways to be able to really uh, bolster our local food system, particularly one that is neighborhood based. Cool. Thank you, Thanks. Viviana. And then um, lastly, you. Nicole, you posted a link to your YouTube channel, the Right to Garden YouTube channel. Can you just talk just very briefly about like kind of what's going on there? Yeah, I just uh, started a YouTube channel to document the story and give expert testimony from people like you, Elliot, more specifics about, you know, what is the context, what's going on, what we're trying to do, uh, where we are in the process, and, you know, why, why should you want to grow your own food? Can you on a suburban lot? How much can you do? You know, all these different issues. 
Um, sometimes people do better, you know, watching a video or putting a video on and listening in the background. Um, and the story is kind of outrageous. So reading, you know, years worth of history is kind of overwhelming, but listening to videos here and there can get you up to speed on what's going on. Cool, thank you. And I saw there's a couple of questions about um, if we're, we're gonna be saving all the links that folks are providing um, in the chat and we're gonna be making recordings of these sessions available. So if you miss anything and wanna go back or if you just wanna share it with somebody, we definitely encourage that so they can uh, learn something. Uh, Kathy, do you have anything you wanna, <laughs> you wanna input before we go? We really appreciate you being here. Oh, I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. Thank you so much. No, um, thank, thank you. Yeah, if anybody has any questions for me or, you know, about when they get into the planning stages or the different kind of beds, um, I think you can send the questions through Matthew. Sure, I'd be happy to gather those for you, Ma. Okay, <laughs> I'd be happy to answer them. It'll keep me a happy person in these days. <laughs> what, what, are, what are sons for? Uh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> cool, well, um, with that, I think that we're uh, good to wrap up, man, unless we've got anything else. Um, but I just want to thank you all again. This is so cool to be able to do this and technology is obviously a great thing. So